in. Um, so you'll be given a little option if you want to leave or continue. So um, this is part of uh, a lecture uh, series uh, looking at a grander project uh, on Chinese investment in Europe and the wider effects of uh, those uh, investments, um, particularly in terms of uh, what are both the positives and negatives of increased uh, uh, Chinese involvement in, in, in Europe in terms of uh, joining us together both physically and in terms of um, increasing the uh, uh, not only connectivity between Europe <coughs> and, and Asia, but also the uh, interconnectivity between different parts of Europe that um, weren't, uh, were kind of left behind uh, during uh, the post-Cold War era or, or during uh, European uh, integration. Um, we have uh, three um, exciting uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, that will be um, far more interesting than, than me, most likely, um, and my rambling at the start of the uh, lecture. First, we have uh, Max uh, uh, Emilian uh, Reich, who is, uh, you still have your association in Shanghai, or? No, I'm now with the Schema Business School uh, in Paris, uh, camp on, the camp on the Paris campus. Paris, Paris camp, very good. Uh, and um, Maximilian is going to give us a, a analysis of uh, railway infrastructure investments, uh, and it's part of a wider project that he's been working on for a number of years. Uh, and um, I'm sure, I think you're going to present one uh, case study uh, today. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, Maximilian, and um, then we'll move on to my uh, co-chair, uh, I guess, uh, who is going to be uh, looking uh, at um, political motivations uh, behind uh, railway projects, particularly looking at Budapest and the, and the Belgrade uh, railway project. And then finally, we're going to look at Francesca's project, looking at investment uh, into Italian uh, maritime uh, ports, so we're going to cover a wide broad of uh, transportation infrastructure. I think the only thing that we're missing now is um, uh, air transportation, which is quite interesting given uh, uh, the recent events with, uh, in Belarus. So we can um, we can see if that uh, pops up uh, in the wider political uh, implications of rail transportation, perhaps. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Maximilian, um, build in a little uh, time into his presentation in case any technical difficulties. So I'll hand over control to Maximilian. Fantastic, thank you so much. I'll be starting to share my screen. Okay, a wonderful good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for making it uh, on this Wednesday morning and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Niall and Agnes, uh, pleasure to be with you. Um, I'll take the next uh, 15 minutes to talk about co-petition and international political economy. Uh, more specifically, as Niall already um, pointed out, um, I'll be analyzing railway infrastructure investment and cooperation in the Asia Pacific region. Now, in the interest of time, I only uh, brought you one uh, case study, but uh, technically the model that I'll present to you uh, can be applied to other case studies at, as I will point out in the very last slides of my presentation today. I am affiliated with um, the Technical University of Munich, um, as well as Renmin Dashe or Renmin University of China with my two supervisors for this PhD, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Miranda Schurz and Professor Dr. Jin San Rong. I'll run you through uh, theory, methodology, and uh, the empiricism. And in that sense, uh, this will be the structure of today's uh, presentation. Let's start with theory, uh, the puzzle, literature, and research gap, and the variables in the hypothesis that I propose. Now, we all know that um, investment from China along the Belt and Road Initiative has been increasing. And uh, when analyzing railway infrastructure projects in the Asia Pacific region and beyond, uh, we see that, of course, railway infrastructure is expensive. And there is uh, a little bit of a challenge with regards to cost efficiency. So um, this is obviously a challenge for everyone who is investing in railway infrastructure, but then obviously uh, down uh, time um, is, is positively impacting uh, each economy. And so ultimately it is productive um, and it has economic efficiency. However, this is not always guaranteed from the outset. 
Um, in terms of the status quo, of course, there has been the Belt and Road Initiative uh, with increased foreign direct investment in the form of state aid subsidies and loans from China. And uh, most recently, we've seen an increased interest um, also from international economic actors um, that, uh, of course, are interested in the Belt and Road Initiative, but also in alternatives such as the EU Asia connectivity strategy, etc. And um, sometimes there have been, you know, discussions on the debt trap, uh, local backlash, etc. And so what I'm looking at is cooperation and competition at the same time, which we call cooperation. My research questions are related, obviously. So what I'm trying to figure out is why are Chinese economic actors investing in railway infrastructure uh, despite high risks and relatively low returns on a specific project based, right? right? And um, in addition to that, of course, uh, subsequently, I look at whether or not there's room for international economic actors and to see um, how they are cooperating despite political opposition and economic competition. So these will be the guiding questions in my presentation today. In terms of the literature, I focus on varieties of capitalism, which uh, all of you know, I'm sure. Uh, so the political framework, uh, which uh, characterizes the states that invest in infrastructure and the economic actors that are from those st states and the kind of coalition building. So what is actually happening with regards to the coalitions that support this infrastructure investment uh, in railway projects? Uh, on the other hand, there is uh, international political economy uh, with the economic actors um, competing, cooperating, and uh, that we call cooperation uh, in terms of the conceptual framework. So the overlap, the research gap is actually how are railway projects uh, initiated and then implemented. A little bit of um, theoretical framework. Um, as I said, many of you know the VOC um, literature. So we have on, let's say, the far liberal and uh, liberal market economies, uh, typically the United States. Then we have mixed market economies and coordinated market economies. Um, uh, examples could be, you know, for example, Germany or France, which is a little bit more coordinated. And then we have the de developmental state model uh, of which China could be um, an example. And the, the difference is basically the role of the state, so an active state or a less active state. Uh, and I think when we look at China, uh, we have an interventionist role of the state uh, with a very strict regulatory control over economic actors uh, and also state aid uh, subsidies and loans, preferential access to finance that is guaranteed. And the logic uh, here is seizing windows of opportunity. So we have a distributional versus an encompassing coalition, as Olsen uh, points out. Distributional um, coalitions would be, you know, trying to get a larger part of the share, whereas encompassing coalitions try to grow the entire cake of the economy. So in that sense, the developmental state model tries to uh, focus on uh, the entire nation and uh, puts economic actors to work in that sense. On the international political economy side, uh, we have, of course, cooperation and competition. And in between, there's this weird element of cooperation, which is neither positive sum nor zero sum, but a kind of simultaneous cooperation and competition between at least two actors um, that are then trying to add value. And uh, when we look at projects, we have project level cooperation. And then if we look at uh, infrastructure initiatives or, or political frameworks, uh, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, then we have network level competition or cooperation. In terms of the variables, um, I have a uh, dependent variable, which is the, the railway infrastructure project uh, with phase one initiation and phase two uh, implementation. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we try to figure out, or what I'm trying to figure out uh, is why are these economic actors investing in the first place? Uh, and then subsequently are international economic actors trying to cooperate on that sphere? Uh, and the hypothesis um, that I put forward is that Chinese economic actors invest in railway infrastructure projects because of a political framework and guarantees of an encompassing coalition. And then subsequently, international economic actors cooperate because of an economic rationale uh, and cooperation. Let's jump into methodology. So I will present to you the research design and then I'll discuss my quantitative data and my qualitative data. The research design is um, basically a comparative case study design with uh, most similar case studies. Um, today, in the interest of time, I only have one for you, but uh, technically it can be um, 
uh, reproduced in other case studies uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, on the one hand, we have this railway infrastructure initiation, where I use quantitative data to actually predict whether or not China is investing. Um, and I use a multitude of indicators, I'll introduce them in a second, uh, and then I build a machine learning model in order to predict whether or not China is investing um, in these infrastructure projects. And then on the qualitative side, I look a little bit into each project and I use a, a SWOT, VRIO and radar diagram with a multivarious qualitative uh, comparative analysis in order to figure out whether you know, political resources, financial resources, material resources, non-material resources or human resources are key and uh, possible fields of cooperation uh, in that specific um, project. In terms of the quantitative uh, data, I used Excel to collect data, big data, um, in the sense that I looked at 25 years, 99 indicators in 183 countries. All in all, I have some 258,000 data points. Then I put that into a machine learning model. Um, I ran um, with RapidMiner nine different machine learning models and ultimately I choose for a random forest decision tree model in order to predict whether or not investment takes place, yes or no, and subsequently also identify which indicators are actually best at predicting uh, disinvestment. And subsequently, I ran uh, some 400, uh, 500 regression analyses, um, and I used that for data visualization, uh, linear regression analysis, and to establish correlation and significance. In terms of the qualitative data, I go through uh, relatively standard business uh, practice concepts uh, such as SWOTs, uh, so trying to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, as well as trends. Um, and this is how I code whether or not there is strength actually happening or uh, present. Um, subsequently, I look at the uh, VRIO, so valuable, rare, uh, imitable, and organized um, competitive advantage uh, and that is how I score the relative strength of the economic actors so the, the specific companies involved uh, and then I identify uh, or not whether there's a mode so a sustainable competitive advantage and then finally I, I use a, a truth table in a radar diagram analysis and there I calculate the relative strength uh, and visualize this relative strength in order to identify where there's room for cooperation between Chinese and international actors uh, in a local environment, always involving the local companies uh, in the country in question. Now let's jump to the case study. This was uh, some nine minutes, so um, I'll uh, discuss one case study today, Malaysia in particular, and um, Let's jump into it. Uh, first of all, we can establish that there has been an increase of railway infrastructure investment uh, by uh, Chinese economic actors over time. I have here from 2004 to 2019, obviously we're most interested in what has happened since 2013, uh, the initiation of the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, of course, there's also a caveat. I talk about that in limitations. I think as of 2020 uh, and uh, COVID, uh, everything has been uh, called into question, but this is where I end my research. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, this, this does not necessarily affect the analysis. In terms of the regions, we see that Africa, the Middle East and Southeast Asia received the lion's share of Chinese infrastructure investment in railways. Uh, and I particularly look at Southeast Asia uh, with the case study Malaysia, but this can be repeated obviously for all the other countries that have received a lot of investment. You see here uh, on um, this, um, let me take the laser pointer. You see here that, uh, for example, Iran has had a, a lot of uh, investments uh, and uh, Nigeria as well. But then uh, in Southeast Asia, there's been a bunch of countries that have received investment from China on railway infrastructure. And finally, here I said, uh, OK, let's look at 2013 to 2020 only. And if we look at that, uh, then you see that South Asia features uh, five times on the top uh, 10 um, investment destinations uh, for uh, Chinese investment in railway infrastructure. So therefore I looked at Southeast Asia first. The quantitative analysis uh, then allows me to identify, you know, and predict whether or not investment takes place. So in terms of the political indicators that I looked at, uh, 17 uh, different indicators, um, it is a 55% accuracy, um, which is, you know, okay. It's not great, but I guess for political sciences, it's, it's uh, relatively good. Um, and I predict whether or not investment is actually taking place, uh, yes or no. Um, and uh, then uh, you have um, the, as you see here, uh, 
highlighted in green. Uh, the correct predictions, 53 uh, countries uh, have actually been predicted correctly, which is 73% uh, or 57% respectively. Uh, so in that sense, it is okay. Uh, in terms of the economic indicators, they are slightly more accurate. Uh, they are slightly more indicators as well. So here I, I look at 25 indicators and the uh, prediction is 65% uh, or 64% accurate. Um, and if you look at the predicted cases of investment, uh, then this goes actually up to even 70%. So the accuracy of a desired prediction, namely Chinese investment is relatively high for let's say non-natural sciences. Uh, obviously in the laboratory, this would be uh, not high enough, but for political sciences, uh, this is uh, good. And on the bottom, you see how uh, the decision tree actually works. So you have, uh, you know, a specific indicator, then you go further and you say yes, no, or a specific amount of, um, you know, for example, um, uh, goods imports, uh, etc. that will then decide on whether or not uh, this, this investment is actually taking place and that you drill down uh, in 200 decision tree models and subsequently you have a result. Let's look at uh, Malaysia specifically. Um, here I, I took the East Coast Rail Link, which is part of the China Indochina um, Economic Corridor. And the East Coast Rail Link, um, if we look at it qualitatively, has received political support. Uh, political support from the Malaysian government, political support from the Chinese government. And so in that sense, yes, everybody is on board in trying to get this project off the ground and actually implement it. Um, you have Prime Minister uh, Najib Razak, for example, saying it is a high impact project that was seamlessly linked to Klang Valley. So on uh, the uh, on the western coast of Malaysia here at Port Klang uh, to the east coast um, and those less developed provinces um, along uh, the east, uh, sorry, uh, yes, the east coast of Malaysia and thereby linking up uh, better the Malaysian uh, railway infrastructure. Now, who is implementing it? Uh, it uh, was starts to be constructed um, by a Chinese company, um, which is called China Communications Construction uh, Corp Company Limited, uh, CCCC. Uh, and it is a joint venture, 50-50% uh, with Malaysia Rail Link. Uh, and so in that sense, these are the driving forces behind it. So again, uh, you know, Malaysian companies involved, Chinese companies, Companies involved and the Malaysians actually hold 100% uh, asset ownership uh, of this project. Local contractors have to be involved, so this uh, actually has a positive e effect on the local economy, I think, which is very important. Um, but the financing comes uh, to 85% from China, from the Export Import Bank, um, and at an interest rate of 3.5%, which is relatively okay, given that we also have inflation to take into account. Um, and we have a total volume of about 10 billion US dollars. Um, you see here the numbers in green are actually renegotiations. Uh, those of you, maybe we have a Malaysian in the room, those of you that have looked at this specific case uh, have seen renegotiation of the terms of conditions, uh, terms and conditions. And so, um, yes, um, COVID has pushed back the project a couple of years or two years. Uh, and then in addition, the Malaysian government has um, invited the Chinese um, uh, economic actors to actually uh, reduce costs, uh, also limit the scope of the project, so it's, it's 44 kilometers shorter now, uh, has increased the percentage in uh, inclusion of local contractors in order to create a greater economic value for Malaysia, and has, uh, and this is uh, very much unheard of for, for infrastructure projects, has actually negotiated down the price, so it is uh, decreasing in terms of the price tag, uh, uh, and it's now 5 billion US dollars cheaper. Um, what I find particularly interesting in this case, uh, and why I wanted to start with this one, is that we have ACOM uh, being involved. Uh, ACOM is a United States company in logistics, um, and they have actually entered into a joint venture with CCCC, uh, and they are going to uh, take care of the servicing of stations, viaducts, tunnels, depots, and signaling along this East Coast railing. So despite of what everyone always hears, the United States is not going to be involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, we actually have a case of uh, an American company being involved um, on the ground. And then HSS Engineers is a consultancy services company, which is actually Malaysian. So you see you have Chinese actors, local actors, and international actors involved. So where does this lead us? Um, I jumped the um, SWOT coding stage uh, and the VRIO scoring stage uh, to provide you with the multivari um, uh, multivariate uh, qualitative 
qualitative comparative analysis truth table and the radar diagram. So once you have coded and scored the, the comparative advantage of the different actors involved, international economic actors, Chinese economic actors, and local economic actors, and you apply, you code and apply a specific score to them, you see that in the different spheres, they have, let's say, a comparative advantage. And me particular, I'm interested in cooperation from international economic actors. So I highlighted and uh, calculated that for the international economic actors. And you see here that um, they have a competitive edge in logistics. They have experience and a competitive edge in due diligence and environmental and social and governance criteria, as well as in global expertise. And so, if you look at the radar diagram, uh, you have an overview of all three actors involved. And indeed, if you are an international company and you would want to uh, help invest uh, in the East Coast Rail Link in Malaysia, you would potentially try to focus on your competitive advantage, which could be either global due diligence and ESG criteria uh, or logistics in that sense. So concluding on the Malaysian Railway Project, um, Yes, I argue that international economic actors should indeed focus on competitive advantage, streamline their efforts and join cooperative ventures in logistics due diligence, ESG criteria and global expertise. Um, they should also be very aware of their potential competitive parity. So, you know, the competition that is taking place with regards to research and development, most importantly, patents and the internet, uh, the, the technology related to railway infrastructure. And they should also be aware of their competitive disadvantage, which um, is uh, an element where they have to very much look out to, to, to not fall further behind, which in this sense is uh, the political support, the financial support, access to credit, etc., cetera, uh, financing. And then, of course, uh, construction and local expertise, uh, which the Mal Malaysians are dominating um, um, very much. So this brings me to the conclusion. Um, I look at the thesis, the limitations and potential future research avenues. Um, the conclusion is that uh, basically I can confirm the hypothesis on uh, railway infrastructure projects. Uh, and I can confirm that Chinese, into, Chinese economic actors invest in railway infrastructure projects because they have the political framework and the guarantees of an encompassing coalition that allows them to invest in a high risk, low returns um, in infrastructure project. And the international economic actors are involved in the implementation phase. Uh, so later on in the project, uh, because of an economic ra rationale uh, and in the framework of competition, uh, if we look at IPE uh, theory. In terms of limitations, I highlighted it earlier on. Yes, uh, COVID is um, somewhat influencing everything. So we have to look out uh, whether or not this is actually holding true in the future, uh, but uh, let's see. And uh, sometimes I have to admit that uh, the data uh, coming in particular from, from Chinese state-owned enterprises is not always uh, readily accessible and sometimes also not necessarily uh, reliable, but I am working with the data that I have. Uh, and because I use the same data sources in that sense, uh, it is, uh, let's say, at least internally reliable. In terms of future revenue, uh, future research avenues, um, we uh, see, of course, that Malaysia is one example. Uh, I could go on with the China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor. So, Laos, uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, and Indonesia are very good cases. Uh, I could also look at the new Eurasia land bridge, uh, looking at, for example, uh, the Corgus dry port where there is DP world that is involved in uh, in the implementation and um, and SAP with uh, regards to the management of the dry port. Uh, Poland uh, has a connection with uh, Lodz Chengdu that is something which could be looked at. Uh, I think there is a Polish company called Halstatam um, that is uh, Halstatam uh, Logistics that is involved. Or Germany, of course, there is a Chongqing Duisburg connection where uh, DB Schenker, the Deutsche Bahn Schenker is involved. So there's plenty of other uh, research uh, avenues news that I could pursue. And ultimately, uh, now I was saying it, uh, I, I have actually collected data on airports, ports, hydropower, um, and renewable energy projects as well. So this is already collected. Uh, so if the model uh, holds true, then I could potentially uh, go for that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, looking forward to your feedback. What do you think? Is it, uh, is it a good model? Uh, does it apply to, to, to instances that you have heard of? Uh, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maximilian. Um, very interesting presentation and 
I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions on, on the model later in the Q&A. Um, so we'll just hand over to, as we're making good time, I'll hand over to August, who's going to uh, present a case on political motivation of railway from Budapest to Belgrade uh, railway project. I should have said earlier that I'll, um, I'll call with three minutes to go to let you know you have a bit of time, but Maximilian was such good. He, so good at his timekeeping, I didn't uh, need to. So um, I'll hand over uh, the floor to August. Thank you. So let me just share my screen and start. Okay, so it's it's on. Um, it's a different position. Usually I'm the one uh, moderating the sessions and now I have to uh, be one of the presenters. And the reason is that, of course, when it comes to BRI, I mean, Belt and Road projects in Europe, uh, the Budapest Belgrade Railway is one of the flagship projects uh, that has been going on over quite some time. So I decided to just briefly uh, present on uh, this case since it seems to be interesting for potentially all of us. This is not a uh, published paper or not even a paper in progress. I've just uh, collected uh, some information for you, try to frame it somehow, uh, have my research questions as well. And at the end, so not at the beginning, since it is not a uh, uh, full research uh, at this point, at the end, I will also suggest some potential hypotheses that could help uh, further frame uh, the whole story. The title is, is uh, the case of a politically motivated railway because I can see if if not fully political rational behind the, the railway, but at least a mixture of economic and political rational. And by the way, this photo is not made of uh, the railway track since it is not ready yet. This is just a nice photo of the, of the railway track. So let's start with just a few information, especially for those who are not uh, fully aware of what has been going on uh, in, with this with this railway project. So the Budapest Belgrade railway upgrade is a reconstruction or if you like a refurbishment of an existing railway line between the two capitals of Serbia and Hungary respectively. This is designed to reduce the journey time for, from eight to three and a half or, or four hours because right now it takes eight hours to get from Belgrade to Budapest by train because it is in a very poor condition. Uh, this project includes uh, the upgrading of the railway to a double track main line capable of supporting travel at uh, 160 km per hour. The full section is going to be 374 km long. The smaller half around 160 km is on the Hungarian side and the rest is on the Serbian side. The construction uh, is uh, financed by a Chinese state loan and uh, this loan accounts for 85% of the total cost, which is 2.1 uh, billion uh, USD in the case of Hungary and around 1.3 billion USD in the case of Serbia. But I can see some Serbian colleagues uh, in the among the participants, so they can correct me later on in the Q and A session. Um, of course, I will use my Hungarian perspective uh, when presenting this case, and of course, I knew know more about uh, the Hungarian case and about the Hungarian section. So the loan for Hungary is a twenty-year loan. Uh, it's a one point eight hundred fifty-five billion USD loan. Uh, with a 2.5% annual interest rate, which is not a preferential loan uh, at all. And the whole project seems to be the most expensive railway investment in Hungary's history so far. Uh, the, as you could see, the Hungarian section is shorter, but more expensive than the Serbian section. So that uh, it is uh, an, an interesting uh, phenomenon, at least. And of course, the construction is built as a flagship project of Belt and Road Initiative in Europe. This railway line will form the final section of the track from uh, the Chinese-owned uh, or the majority Chinese-owned Greek port of Piraeus. 
uh, with the aim of linking the Greek port and of course China with Western Europe for the transportation of goods since passenger transport is not a key point here at all, using North Macedonia, Serbia and Hungary as uh, transit countries. Here I, I have to at least uh, in indicate that although this is going to be sometime in the future, a long line directly from Piraeus to Budapest. Right now, uh, the sections between Piraeus and Skopje and Skopje and Belgrade have yet to be built. And as far as I know, there hasn't been any uh, happenings uh, in, in this field. This slide shows you the timeline of the events. As you could see, it started back in 2013 and uh, the construction was supposed to have begun in, in, in 2015, making it operational by 2017. But there has been quite a lot of delays. There have been some uh, uh, tensions between the European Commission and Hungary. So it has been delayed many times. Uh, the Hungarian Chinese consortium has secured the construction contract two years ago. Hungary and China have signed a loan agreement last year. And it seems, at least right now, that the Hungarian section will be completed by 2025. The Serbian section is composed of uh, uh, three subsections, and two of those three subsections uh, are already under construction. They are not yet ready yet, as far as I know, but at least uh, they have started construction works. And the Hungarian side, we haven't started construction works yet. So these are the most important information you need to know about the railway. So it's a long story, uh, considering the fact that China is usually building infrastructure relatively efficiently, relatively fast. This story is already uh, an eight year saga. It is not over yet. And as a result, it has attracted a number of uh, misconceptions over the last years. There are quite a lot of questions uh, by experts, by EU institutions, by the opposition in Hungary, for instance, and probably also in Serbia, asking, asking about uh, who needs the line anyway, what are the motivations, background rationales in case of China, in case of Hungary, in case of Serbia, and who benefits and who foots the bill. Uh, to just quickly answer the first question, who needs the line anyway? So. As we all know, infrastructure, be it in the core of Europe or on the peripheries of Europe, be it just a railway or a power plant, uh, improves the functioning of economy and that it has significant impact both on productivity and growth. So infrastructure in general is important and it has been a hot topic in Central and Eastern Europe in the past decades. Central and Eastern Europe lags uh, behind compared to Western Europe uh, in in terms of uh, its infrastructure development or level of its infrastructure. And the Western Balkans lags a bit behind compared to uh, the EU member C countries as well. So infrastructure development has been on the agenda in, in the region for at least two decades. In the EU member states of the region, uh, quite a lot of EU found money uh, has been used for for upgrading the infrastructure and there has been a lot of development uh, in this sense. Uh, Hungarian railways are well probably we have a bit more than, than Serbia but but still these are generally in poor condition and there are many lines where renovation is rather urgently needed. So for instance this line we are talking about the original line is more than a hundred years ago, of course, with a few renovations uh, in the past decades, but still these need some restructuring. However, this line, this specific line between Budapest and Kelebia are not on the top priority list because uh, although this is the shortest option from Budapest to Belgrade, but it avoids every important city in Hungary, which means that it will never help uh, people to get from A to B, uh, but it will help Chinese companies to transfer their goods to Europe, while there are some other lines that uh, are used for passenger transport, and these are also in poor condition and probably those uh, would receive some priority uh, with 
from from the from the Hungarian government or from EU institutions. So let's turn uh, to motivation. So what are China's motivations in this story? Maybe this is the easiest part since uh, uh, this makes a good sense uh, from from Chinese perspective. So for instance, the financial terms favor China. So China will be repaid with interests even if the railway operates at loss. The contractors will be Chinese state-owned firms, which means that funds for the project to cycle right back to China and can help deal with Chinese overcapacities in engineering or in construction. Building diversifying trade routes. Uh, this is one of the theory to explain the thinking behind uh, this whole uh, railway line reconstruction. So uh, China are really working on diversifying uh, its uh, routes to Europe. So having as many possible gates or entrances in order to avoid uh, being dependent on just a few. But beyond all those arguments, I mean, the argument about exporting overcapacity or diversifying trade routes, there is another uh, uh, reason for China to be interested in this renovation, uh, that is politics and, and symbolism. So if the renovation is uh, successful or will be successful in the end, which means that it will be finished at all, that could open the doors uh, to European construction market for Chinese companies because this project, with this project, they could demonstrate that Chinese companies can work to EU standards and uh, can be as efficient as possible. Of course, the timeline I've just showed you a few minutes before shows the opposite. It shows that it seems that at least on European soil or on EU soil, it is not as easy and not as efficient and not as fast uh, uh, for China to build uh, any infrastructure. If we move on to Serbia's potential motivations, probably these are less straightforward, but not that difficult to understand. So as I've already mentioned, Western Balkan countries are still lagging behind in infrastructure development compared to the European Union countries. And for them, EU funds are not available or at least less accessible. And uh, they are absolutely happy with uh, this new railway line, at least based on the government's communication, since this could mean the fastest direct connection towards uh, Western Europe. This picture has been taken by journalists just a few months ago in March when President Vucic said that this is going to be uh, the most modern railway, the most technologically advanced railway in Western Balkans. And as you can see, there are already some finished uh, subsections, uh, as I've mentioned. But besides uh, infrastructure improvement, which is one of the major aims uh, Serbia uh, have potentially with, with this project, uh, it seems that Serbia also wants to please China and, and probably also Russia, since one of the section is built by a Russian company. So one of the Chinese built railway sections is actually built by a Russian company. And this uh, uh, aim to please uh, non-European friends could come from the disappointment in the EU, disappointment in the accession procedure, uh, which resulted in uh, uh, a more kind of opening up towards non-European players, non-European allies for Serbia. Hungary's case is even more interesting, uh, at least for me or, or from the perspective I'm looking at this story since this is an EU member country having access to all the EU funds, which the country is using for, for infrastructure upgrading for quite some time. But still, uh, Hungary seems to be very much committed uh, towards uh, the development of this uh, railway line. Uh, usually, the Hungarian government has quite a lot of uh, explanation for that. For instance, they usually say that they would like to become a transportation hub. Uh, this is often used by government officials. However, China already have, as we all know, several hubs or gateways or bridges to Europe, which means that they can already 
uh, able to reach Europe uh, more cheaply or even more efficiently through other ports in Germany, for instance, or even at, at the Adriatic, uh, including the harbors of Koper in Slovenia, Trieste in Italy, or Rijeka in Croatia, all of which are, are nearer to the heart of Europe, if you like. The government also argues that the investment is of the highest public interest uh, for Hungary. But feasibility study and the contract is classified for 10 years, so we don't really know what those high interest uh, could mean. And in addition, no one can explain why the costs for the project are so high, since the line, after all, is just 160 kilometers long, runs across a flat terrain, free of natural obstacles, such as major rivers or mountains, which means that it should be uh, uh, at least less uh, expensive. Commitment or even determination towards China uh, is another potential motivation, although not uh, really uh, uh, repeated by the government, but uh, the opposition. And in fact, the Hungarian government regularly takes the opportunity to promote bilateral relations with China and supports the country over many sensitive issues. Here, I wouldn't go into details, but I'm sure that you have heard of many stories recently about Hong Kong, the South China Sea, or the Belt and Road, uh, where Hungary is usually uh, votes in favor of China or decides to stay out from different type of uh, documents condemning uh, Chinese initiatives. This engagement is at least, at least for China, signaling Hungary's goodwill and making the point that the country is a strong political partner in Europe. And for Hungary, probably China or the partnership with China provides uh, some kind of support or alignment uh, with a major power that can hedge against the criticism and, and opposition Hungary is facing in Europe and it is facing quite often. And finally, cronism or crony capitalism is again an interesting feature mentioned by many experts since apart from using uh, such Chinese project to just slap the EU, the government also wants to enrich good friends for instance, the company that won the contract to build the railway line together with two Chinese companies is owned by Lorenz Mesaros, who is a childhood friend of the Hungarian prime minister and who is winning quite a lot of tenders uh, recently, I mean, in the past decade. So uh, I don't have any conclusion since I have quite a lot of open questions in this regard. And uh, when it comes to who benefits and who foots the bill questions, uh, the answer could be simply that China, the one uh, that is benefiting the game and, and the Hungarian and Serbian taxpayers that, that's paying for it. But of course, hopefully it won't be that simple. Uh, for now, it seems that at least we have the transit fees, uh, uh, which the country can get or both countries can get as soon as the travel begins on the railway line, although we are not yet aware of uh, how big these transit fees will be, if they will be enough to cover, for instance, the loan repayments. And we don't know that what happens if there won't be too much transit on the lines. Uh, that is again, uh, a big question. And uh, another issue is whether there will be enough trains going both directions since trains between China and Europe are usually fully loaded when they are coming. Uh, to Europe from China, but they are almost fully empty when returning to China. Duties can be, of course, a potential benefit from the story or logistics centers could be something, uh, uh, an added value uh, if built along the line. Uh, it could have even a spillover effect and would bring capital and create new sources of employment in the country. But since the feasibility study uh, has been classified, we don't know about such opportunities yet. However, the Hungarian government announces every single Chinese investment, even at the initial stage. So if there were any logistic centers planned along the line, I think that uh, we would have already heard about it. So far, it seems that the economic rationale is there in all cases. 
but uh, the political motivation is there as well. And it also seems that uh, there are there seems to be less economic rationale in the European side uh, and more uh, political motivation, especially in the case of Hungary. And as I've promised at the end of the presentation, here I suggest some potential uh, hypotheses that could help uh, to frame this story, this, this research in the future. As I've mentioned, this, these were just a few initial steps. Your three minute warning there. Okay. Uh, I will be able to finish within one, hopefully. So here you can see the varieties of capitalism that has already been mentioned by, by Maximilian. So whether the varieties of capitalism and national administrative traditions have any impact on CE countries' policy preferences. CE countries are usually dependent market economies, which means that uh, it could have some impact on countries' decision, although I already know that there are some countries such as, for instance, Czechia or Poland that uh, are usually at least saying no to such Chinese initiative, Why th there are Hungary or Serbia that are, that are more welcoming in this sense. There is another uh, uh, potential hypothesis whether the global economic crisis had led governments to turn away from the EU towards uh, non-EU players such as Russia or China. Uh, economic interdependence and security concerns can also affect countries' alignments with China. Probably, for instance, this explains why the Baltic states and Poland say no to China, since they have their security reasons or security concerns for that, uh, and, uh, and Hungary don't. And the, the fourth one could be that whether countries lagging behind in terms of infrastructure development are more inclined to invite China or Russia to fill the infrastructure gap than countries with less significant infrastructure backwardness. So this, these could be those hypotheses, those lines, this research could go forward in the future. And I stop here with a cartoon from Choice uh, that is another platform dealing with China uh, from Central and Eastern European perspective. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, excellent timing, then to the minute. Um, we're now moving on to uh, Francesca's uh, presentation, which is on Chinese investment in Italian ports beyond maritime uh, infrastructure. And as um, somebody from an island, um, port investment uh, might uh, pops out at me as something quite uh, interesting um, in terms of developing interconnectivity. Uh, so, Francesca, I invite you to um, share your PPT to us. Thank you, Niall. Sure. Just give me a second. I'll share my PPT. I hope everyone can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll start right away. Um, my main question, so this research is not an academic research. It's actually the result of a research that we were um, doing, we have been doing in the last year at the Italian Institute for Foreign Affairs, where we're where we are analyzing the well developments of the agreements uh, within the Memorandum of Understanding signed by Italy in 2019 with China, and this section, of course, deals with ports. And the driving question was, you know, has generally speaking, uh, the BRI MOU of March 2019 increased Chinese investments in port infrastructures? Uh, the short answer, and then we could conclude here the presentation, but I'll give you more details, is no. Um, most of the agreements that I've seen developments actually predate the March 2019 uh, MOU and many of them are not even part of the MOU itself and we'll see how the two agreements that were actually part of the MOU did not have any development at all. Um, the two uh, signing entities were the port of Genoa and the port of Trieste, but of course Chinese investments and agreements have been signed also with the port of Venice, Taranto, Naples and Salerno and Ravenna. 
Um, we, just to give you a few examples, uh, in Venice, um, CCCC has invested in the construction of a high bottom quay, which is quite common in the northern part of Italy. We have quite high bottom quay already, but you know you need to develop those. So this is one of the elements that all the northern Italian ports have been uh, quite keen to develop. And then in 2019, the city signed an MOU with Costco. Because, of course, if you think about the geography, linking Venice with the port of Piraeus was quite um, reasonable, right? And then in Ravenna, actually in 2018, at China Merchants Group, who, who, which is another uh, Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise, has invested in developing what was supposed to be the European hub for naval, for naval engineering. Um, the hub is there. I'm not quite sure whether it is uh, uh, renowned as being the European hub for naval engineering. Um, but as I told you before, and most importantly, the two signatories to the MOU, Dino and Trieste, did not see any further significant development after 2019. Exception made, and we'll get there, uh, for the so-called BRI terminal of Vado Ligure in uh, Liguria, is always northern part of Italy. Um, I will get there later. I'll try to move on to the next slide. Yes. This is just to give you an idea of where these two ports are. This is the northern part of Italy and you have Trieste who's there in the east and then you have Genoa with the um, near uh, other ports in the west. Um, the reason why they're placed together with other ports is that in Italy the new organization of port activity is organized in uh, port authority which includes more than one port. And these are two of uh, the, port, the most important port authority. Uh, moving on, yes. So what was part of uh, the agreement? Um, both agreements within the MOU ha were signed with the with CCCC and not with Costco. And this already gave a sort of signal that yes, uh, maritime activity were of main interest, but they were not necessarily linked with the port itself. It was slightly broader than that. Um, in general, the interest was for a breakwater dam, uh, which was an um, agreement and a project of 1 billion uh, euros, one of the largest projects undertaken by the port of Genoa in the last uh, years. But uh, because of you know, European and Italian legal regulations, um, they had to undergo a public procurement and the consortium created by CCCC did not win the bid, which means that CCCC actually arrived only seventh. And therefore the development of the breakwater dam has been given to somebody else. And I think this is important to bear in mind that despite the fact that the Port of Genoa and CCCC had signed an MOU, which specifically looked at the breakwater dam as potential future developments, when it came to actually materializing um, this agreement because of legal constraints, this was not possible because nonetheless CCCC had to undergo a public procurement, which it did not win. And then in Trieste, the interest was not, um, well, as far as CCCCC, I always, I think I always forget one C, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, but as far as the Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise is concerned, um, the interest was for two rail stations, which were to go and form a multimodal rail station which would connect the port to other railways, uh, mostly uh, connecting to Central and Eastern Europe, as Agnes had already uh, mentioned previously. The project had the blessing of Brussels originally, and it was part of the well-known New China connectivity platform. Um, and then, of course, because the global situations change and the debate around Chinese investments in general in critical infrastructure changed, this blessing was not necessarily there when in 2019 uh, Italy signed the memorandum. Nonetheless, in November 2019, the port of Trieste side, uh, signed an extra memorandum um, with the CCCCC much more specific when they were uh, referring to these two stations, how to develop them and how to uh, develop the project itself. Yet, uh, last year, um, there were no developments. 
this year there's still no developments and initially we thought it was for the pandemic and in part of course for the American sanctions on that specific state-owned enterprise but interestingly when speaking with people from uh, the port of Trieste they made an assessment saying that you know there's no space to develop the project which is at least from my perspective is quite interesting that you know uh, two years after signing this MOU and several years after launching this project, they came to the conclusion that there was not enough space. So one might wonder whether, you know, is this the true reason or is it a way to, you know, kill the project? Because uh, in order to avoid Chinese involvement in what might be seen as a critical infrastructure project. And then also part of the second MOU signed between Trieste and um, CCCCC, there was a development of a sizable intermodal rail terminal in the city of, I think it's Kosice, I'm not quite sure whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, in um, Slovakia. As of August 2020, both were saying that, you know, the conclusion of this deal was very close, uh, but now it has been almost a year and still uh, we know basically nothing about the developments. So I'm not quite sure what will be of these parts as well. And then separately, but still connected, not part of the MOU, but still, you know, the interest of a Chinese state-owned enterprises in enterprise into the port of Trieste, in 2019, China Merchants Group began negotiations for the acquisition of the intermodal platform in the port, and this would be in the port. So unlike the agreement uh, for uh, the two rail stations, which are outside of Trieste and outside of the port, um, this one was actually a development project within the port. Um, they started negotiations for the acquisition, but last year, uh, the German uh, Hafen and Logistic um, acquired 50.01% of uh, that platform. So basically formally sidelining any potential future Chinese investment in um, Trieste. But yet, so now here you can see the top 10 European ports from 2020. And as you can see, there are no Italian ports, right? Uh, we know that in previous years, uh, both Genoa and Trieste sometimes were in this top 10, but because of other ports developing uh, much better, uh, this is the current situation, which means that, you know, for at least for Italy, um, there is quite a strong feeling that we need investments in the um, maritime sector, mostly thinking about um, the potential to develop the Mediterranean basin much more than it has in the past few years. So why were there no developments? Um, we identified five main uh, elements. One is the changed political climate, I think geopolitical climate. I think I've already mentioned this. Um, since the mid 2010s, the debate on Chinese investments and Chinese investments in critical, in critical infrastructures has become quite um, important. And so also governments have started to change their perspective. But most importantly, um, in the very last part of the second half of the decade, um, Chinese investments, the reception of Chinese investments has become so politicized that it's quite difficult to justify to also the public opinion something as big as investments in uh, two port infrastructures. I think to a certain degree, most importantly, uh, the sanctions on um, CCCC made it very difficult for um, Trieste to further develop any agreements and it also made it not economically convenient and then, of course, you had the third element, which is the direct pressure from the United States administration. The Americans have become much more active in all these ports in the past few years. Um, and from a purely Italian perspective, the change of government. The MOU was signed during a populist coalition between two populist parties, uh, both of which, for different reasons, were keen to develop a better relationship with uh, uh, Chinese counterparts, 
Um, but then the we had we changed government actually in September 2019. I'm, I'm trying to remember when Italy changed government because I'm, I'm sure you're aware we change government quite often. So it's it's not easy to keep track. And we changed government in September 2019, and then you had a mainstream. Uh, central left party joining the one populist party, the five star movement, and there already you had a bit of a balancing act. Um, it was not necessarily a government that was less um, positive towards China, but it was a government that was much more embedded into the European framework and the Western alliances framework and more keen to, let's say, respecting the normal rules. And then, of course, now we have a new government uh, led by uh, Mario Draghi, who is definitely very much into, you know, transatlantic relationship, positive transatlantic relationship, and obviously um, keeping Italy fully embedded into the European framework. And then finally, the last reason, and I think we mentioned already this, why didn't develop any further are legal frameworks, both from the point of view of public procurement, and that one is quite strict, in terms of the development of um, big infrastructures, but also through the years, both at European level at, and, and at national level, the discipline on the screening and blocking of foreign direct investments has developed. And of course, the European one is not particularly strong and it has, it has just begun to be implemented. So we can't say that it had a direct impact on the situation. And the Italian one is highly arbitrary which means that according to the government that you have at the time and the decision that the government, the government makes, an investment can be blocked or just uh, green lighted. Still, they, they had an impact on the public debate and on the political debate and definitely they had a way of influencing the course of the development of these agreements in Italy. And then we get to the exception, which is the port of Vado Ligure. And I don't know if you remember the map, but it's very close to Genoa and is part of the same port authority. Um, this is officially a BRI terminal in Europe. And it has been fully operative since summer 2020, basically. Um, originally, it was an investment from APM terminals, which is part of the Danish Marsk from 2007. But then after the well, global financial crisis and the euro crisis, it became quite difficult for APM to uh, keep sustaining all the projects that he had on board and some were cancelled. But the Ligure was not cancelled, but they brought in 2016, they brought on board both Costco and Qingdao port, uh, which are minority shareholders at the majority of shares still uh, is in the hands of APM and they created this new joint venture called APM Terminus Vadoligra SPA, which I think is the correspondent of LTD, more or less. Um, and the um, and they developed this new terminal, which is an absolutely super modern technological terminal. Um, and of course, because then you have a Costco as an important player in Vadoligure, they immediately in October 2020 uh, created a new maritime line to connect the port of Piraeus and Vadoligure, linking the two of them, um, which I mean, I think it was a predictable development. And, but I think that even here, what is important to see is that even though it's just, it has just opened in 2020, it's actually a long-standing development. It's not something new, it's not something that, you know, signals that after 2019, there has been an increase of Chinese investments in Italian ports. It just shows that, you know, previous to that time when Chinese investments became controversial, um, you had quite a lot of projects being launched and in which, um, Chinese investments were involved. And to conclude, I just want to make a short, uh, these are actually more op open questions and um, things I haven't necessarily looked in detail about, you know, how the maritime uh, dimension connects with uh, the rest. And the railways, I think it is interesting after what Agnes said and showed in her map about the connection between the port of Piraeus up to um, Hungary, is that um, as far as the Greek uh, section is concerned, actually um, China had already tried to uh, acquire that part. 
But what happened is that, again, there was a public bid and funnily enough, Italian Railways won that public bid. So now that part um, is actually well, in part owned by Italian Railways and it should be developed by Italian Railways. I say funnily because if you've ever traveled uh, by train in Italy, um, I mean, again, we have quite a few issues, so I don't see how um, Italian Railways might have won that bit, but still happened. Probably the Chinese were even worse, I have no idea. And this is the reason why in Italy you don't have investments from Chinese counterparts into the railway sect sector. The, only, the one in Trieste was sort of an exception. And he, of course, it was about a station and not a trade of railways. And then, but we have investments from 2017 into Italian highways. It's just a 5% uh, from the Silk Road Fund, but it's there. And of course, um, we're keeping an eye on it. And finally, I think something that will become increasingly important to understand is data management. Um, when a Chinese enterprise or any other enterprise invests in critical infrastructures that are most uh, that are increasingly um, technologized and digitalized, uh, digitalized. Sorry, um, how are these? How are the data they gather managed? How are they used? Um, Who is actually um, managing those data, and so on and so forth. And of course, this was one of the concerns for Vado Ligure, but apparently the data are managed by Leonardo, which is a quite important aerospace, defense and security Italian enterprise. Three minute warning there. I'm, I'm, I'm closing now. Um, I just think, you know, this is one of the elements. And I think uh, when speaking with people from the Netherlands as well, they thought, you know, this is one of the elements of, that in the future will be of most uh, interest. And I'm closing here. Thank you. <laughs> There's always a danger with um, giving people the three minute warning that they finish straight away. But, um, Thank you very much to all the presenters. They were uh, wonderful uh, presentations, and I'm sure everybody uh, watching today would, uh, would agree. Um, and very much a common theme running across all three of uh, smokes and, and mirrors and uh, unfinished uh, business uh, with a lot of uh, politics mixed into decision making about where and, and how. Uh, decision making is is made in terms of uh, Chinese investment, and I was particularly interested in uh, hearing about how um, public uh, procurement laws are actually working <laughs> in some cases, which is always a surprise uh, to me. Um, so I'm sure we're going to have uh, many interesting questions coming out of the Q and A. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the recording will stop uh, now.